and just scared. Like, I'm like, Anna, like, please, like, please come. I'm having a bad trip. I really need your support. Well, I until I was 30, how old am I now? I'm 41 now. So I, I was 34 years old when I did LSD for the first time. And I was like, why'd you wait so long? I said, nobody ever offered me any. Why did nobody offer you more LSD? No, I, I mean, everybody offered me a lot of cocaine and a lot of MDMA. Mm. No one ever offered me any uh, uh, LSD. That's sad. Had anyone offered me any LSD, I would have gladly not, I, I would have popped that cherry a lot sooner. I feel, yeah. I feel, I Mushrooms, though, I, that was an early one. Yeah. LSD I remember the first time I ever did it and I had like the most mind blowing experience same I was comp I mean who doesn't have a mind blowing experience in LSD it's, it's kind like, like, of part of it's it not, it's not like a casual trip to the supermarket <laughs> is it I, I ended up taking it on this sugar cube and I ended up going for a, like a six hour walk on the seafront in the pissing rain. And I just remember getting lost in my left pocket for fucking the whole duration <laughs> trying of to this find trip. Some, trying to find something? <laughs> Literally. So I, in my pocket, right, I had my phone, my keys and my wallet. And I remember this whole experience of going, oh, my keys. And then the next thing would be, oh, my, oh, wallet. my phone. Oh, my keys. <laughs> oh, my phone. <laughs> and because it was like I could only fixate on one thing only at any anybody, given time only anybody that's done psychedelics would understand that connection yeah. I, I was so in the present moment that anything that had happened within the fucking couple of seconds prior was just non-existent didn't, didn't, didn't happen did, yeah, it wasn't did, there it wasn't there no. I remember the, one of the first few times we did mushrooms and there was a, a small group of us that came together and we ate quite a it was, it was probably the equivalent of a heroic dose for your first time at least. And I remember we just wanted to get high t because we were just, nothing made sense. We we're all over the place. And so all we needed to do was get the weed and the bong and the lighter together all in one place in order to be able to have everything we needed to smoke. <laughs> yeah. And so like one person was in charge of the weed, one person was in charge of the bong, because that was the most responsibility one person could have. And we even, were, even that was boring. And it was, like, it was like everybody, like we'd come back and like the weed was there and the bong was there, but there was no lighter. So we'd send somebody to go get the lighter and then the lighter would come back, but the weed would disappear. And it was like a two hour operation just to get these three necessary pieces of equipment to get high. It's, it's, it's literally bizarre, took, it literally took up our whole night just trying to smoke. I believe that. And it's bizarre to think that they're probably all business owners now. I know at least one of those three people is definitely <laughs> a business owner right now. You've well, overcome think, some challenges to get here, Brian. Well I, done. I, good assumption. I'm pretty sure that all three of us are business owners now. Yeah. Okay. All three of you run successful businesses <laughs> and you were completely incapable of bringing the simplest of operations together with a lighter, a bong and with some With so weed. much pride. Yeah. Well, you've come a long way and I'm, I was I, I'm proud of you. I did graduate college. Congratulations. Are we on film right now? Yeah, we're, we're, we're going. We're, we're, we're in. start? We're, we're in. We're already in. We've been talking about fucking psychedelics for the last oh, okay. five minutes. That's, I mean, it fits. That's kosher? Yeah, we're, we're absolutely We can talk about whatever we want on your platform. Listen, Brian. Can Brian, I say fuck? You, you can say fuck as many fuck. times as you want. You say whatever the fuck you fuck. want. Don't, just keep doing it. Can you just, if you want, we're just going to sit here the whole podcast while you just sit there and look deep into my eyes saying the word fuck. Hold space for me. Ready? Okay. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, welcome to the world of self-development, guys. If anybody's uh, really interested in mindset or any kind of healing modalities, then all you have to do is look deeply into the person's eyes and just say, so, fuck. There you go. Okay, perfect. So yeah. we're on to a fucking winner. I, I feel like this is a really good start. It's well, inspiring. It's an I, inspiring I, conversation I, already. Yeah, does, does anybody feel inspired and motivated? <laughs> welcome to the new world. <laughs> Shit. So for anybody that doesn't know who Brian is, other than the man that really struggles to make a bong, um, <laughs> can you give people a little bit of background you've obviously already been on the podcast um, but yeah just give people a little I bit of I did have a side hustle right? making beer bonks in, in high school okay okay cool okay let's start with that so you're obviously an entrepreneur yeah it was innovative yeah. like okay so I mean, we might as well go down this lane let's we do it already, no, no, we're we've already now. started we're done we're fucked so every, at that time everyone was making these little thin tube funnel beer bongs it was like kind of like the little bitch version yeah. sorry for all the little bitches out there <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I realized this is not innovative like first of all it's it doesn't have like a, a on off switch it's literally it's awkward so i just decided to go to ace hardware and see what kind of like real you like pieces of equipment i could piece together to make like a proper beer bong you and what that ultimately over. looked like was two funnels that connected to one mouthpiece, and the mouthpiece had a big on and off valve, so you could literally put, I think it was like eight beers in this thing, and who would ever beer, who would ever try to beer bang, bang eight beers? I did. <laughs> How did that go? I did, it let, it's six, about six beers worth went down, and it projectiled 
out the second that it all went in. So that was, anyways, that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial escapades. I I'm trying to work out whether you're a problem solver or a problem creator at this point. Uh, at this point, it was a little bit of both. We yeah. had to have both. You, have, you can't solve a problem if there's not a problem to begin with. That's a good point. The, so, so, so at you're, the, you're at the time, the beer bong situation was. So you're the like the government, point. you create a problem, then you fix it. A uh, terrible analogy, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was quite a good one, really. I thought it makes perfect sense. It, it does, actually. Here's the problem, now here's the solution. I, I and the only difference is I didn't create the beer bong problem. That was a problem that pre-existed oh, my creation. Okay, okay. Yeah. We're, we're always prepping up. So uh, it, took me about, it took me about $8 to build those things, and I was selling them for 30 bucks, I think, at the time. And so other than mowing lawns, it was my first entrepreneurial escapade. Okay, so, I mean, let's get to it. Tell me a little bit about Brian, of course, the, the beer bong, the beer pong route. Well, oh, we, got that out of the, we got that out of the yeah, way. Yeah, okay, so I feel like that wasn't the biggest component. Like, I mean, I know you. I feel like there's different layers to your entrepreneurial journey. I can't help but feel that it didn't all start there. It was a turning point in my life. The biggest <laughs> one at the time. There's been many since. Um, where do we start? What do you want to know? Just tell me a little bit about Brian, where you come from, where you're, <coughs> what you're all about and what you're doing now. Just so As if know. the people didn't pretend that they didn't watch our first this conversation. This the first one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, born and raised California, Northern California. Anybody who's been to California, you know that it's kind of two states. You have Northern California, you have Southern California. Born and raised in Northern California. I couldn't get out of there fast enough when I turned 18, so I wanted to go as far away as I could from home without having to pay out-of-state college tuition. Yes, I went to college. And uh, so that ended up me in, me in San Diego, um, right on the conveniently located on the border of Mexico and Tijuana, which fared well oh, for my first couple years in college. Cool. Side stories for later, okay. maybe, if you can remember to bring it back there. And, um, and so I'm going to date myself. I started university in 1999, and I went to the number one party school in the planet, on the planet at the time, per Playboy magazine. The beer they, had, they had some clout. And so my, my beer bong escapades actually paid off by the time I got to college. Uh, but I changed my major a bunch of times. I, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life going into college. And I had even lesser of an idea of what I wanted to do with my life by the time I finished. I changed my major so many times that I was going into my fifth year. I'm supposed to be done in four. I was going into my fifth year. And uh, I went and met with a counselor. And I was like, all my friends were starting to finish. And I was like, ma'am, please. I just want to fucking, I'm going to say it. I just want to fucking get out of here. Please tell me what degree am I closest to achieving? And she's like, let me check. Okay, but punched in her little computer, I'm pretty sure. And she's like, you're 30 units away from a degree in communications. And I was like, communications it is. <laughs> what does that even mean? And it's like management and learning how to communicate. The irony, the irony right? And so uh, I finished school in 2005 and... I read my first book that I wasn't forced to read out when I, almost right after I finished university, and that was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And that was like being raised into a family with a pretty poor dad who was not versed in entrepreneurial pursuits or you know, building his little empire or you know, he was, I came from very humble beginnings. I love my dad for all the values he gave me. Amazing human being. Sounds like shit on you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not an entrepreneurial bone in his body, but an amazing human being. He gave me all the hippie love that uh, a, 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 someone born in the early 1960s would normally pass on to their child. Yeah. So that's where I get my deeply loving, compassionate side. That comes from mom and dad. Thanks, mom and dad, for being the hippies that you were. Thank you. Thank you for the raised good me with so much love. Uh, and that's where it all began, man. I, I feel like that lit a fire of, fuck, I want to build an empire. Like, there's people out there that are doing really amazing things. They're out there changing their world in their own little way. And that began my pursuit into life driven by material gain and possession success meant as many zeros as you could possibly put in your bank account with as big a real estate portfolio as you could possibly acquire in one lifetime and that was my pursuit and i did that for a while okay and as i happen to know that all took a little bit of a shift and took you on a bit of a different path right yeah we don't need to go into all the details we went in last time but thank god for okay. 2008 and the mortgage <laughs> cri crisis and crash the short version of the longer story that I told last time is 2005 to 2008. I was that young hustler, early 20s, mortgage broker, thinking he was hot shit, driving around in big flashy cars and buying condos. And um, I had a really good conscience, I thought. I wanted to, you know, I always had that 
good guy, want to make a difference, want to do right by people. Um, and, and I had a, 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 sol a solid moral compass. But as far as what my perception of success was, it was really off the mark. And I needed the real estate crash of 2008 to bitch slap the fuck out of me so I could get my shit together and realize what is actually really important in this world. What's going to really make me happy? Because the money wasn't doing it. That's the thing. I feel like, isn't that the message that so many people are getting out now? It's like, I've made something. I've had some level of financial success. I didn't wake up blissed out every single day of my life as a result. If anything, it made me, left me feeling empty. And I needed to really feel that in order to realize that it's time to reset my compass and go a different way. I love it, man. So that brings us on perfectly to where you're at now because you are doing some very cool shit, my friend. And that is one of the reasons I want to get you on here. I want you talking about this stuff. So I had the pleasure of experiencing it last week, which we'll obviously get into. But I want you to tell people a little bit about what you're putting together right now and what you're working on. How far back do we go? Wow. As far as makes sense. Okay. So can I drink a, can I have a drink of water first? No. Will you make no, eye contact you, with me while put, I take a drink of water? Put that down. Put that down. Look at me. Put it down. Oh, he's a disobedient little fuck, isn't he? I, can't, I, can't I don't fit it. in the box, Joe. Don't uh, try to tell me what to do just because it's your disgusting. podcast. Okay, I can get up and don't walk. Dare I can put get the up glass and walk down. out of here anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it all started about four years back. I was invited to a breath work. Actually, it goes back a little bit farther than that. My introduction into breath work came <laughs> from watching a Wim Hof YouTube video in circa 2016. And it was a short, punchy little video. But he was, I just remember it was like four minutes of breath work and then a breath hold at the end. And he was explaining it and whatever. And it was on some kind of podcast or something. And I remember I held my breath. I'd never been able to hold my breath for longer than, uh, stretch, stretch breath hold, maybe 60 seconds. And I remember being like holding my breath for an abnormal amount of time. And looking down, when I finally opened my eyes, I finally felt breath hunger coming and I wanted to push it till the max. And I was holding my breath for three and a half minutes. It's like, what the fuck is going on inside of my biology, my, the biochemistry of my body? Something was shifting. And I felt super high. And I, it was like, I, it registered as something really cool, but, that, and it, but it planted a seed. It wasn't the time for me to really get into it, but that seed was there. So when I got, got invited to do a breathwork journey at the beginning, excuse me, at the beginning of the yoga lab days, we had a guy who was coming out to guide us on a 30-day body transformation experiment challenge with Yogi Lab. Um, uh, his name is Steon, amazing human, massive like ex-bodybuilder type. He is the kind of guy that has all the certificates on his wall and there's not enough space on the wall for all the certificates. But this particular time in his life, he was going through a really challenging time. It was like that classic dark night of the soul time for him. He had family members coming down with crazy cancer, relationship problems, health problems. He was not sleeping at all. He's an insomniac. So he was downing a bunch of Ambien one night a week just to make sure he wasn't going to go clinically insane. And so to sleep five or six hours. So he showed up like this to Bali, pale skin, out of shape, not doing so hot. So when we got invited to do this breathwork journey, he was like, yes, let's, let's do it. We all got the crew together. I had never done a full like proper deep dive guided breathwork journey before. And we're all on the ground, we all get started, guided by Lucas Mack and Hella. Love you guys from Awaken Breathwork, hello. Legends. <clears throat> Absolute legends. Part of the reason why I'm doing this, thank you guys for the inspiration. Homeboy within five minutes was having what sounded like a full body exorcism, as opposed to half body exorcism, but like a full body. A proper one. A proper exorcism, screaming, shouting, laughing, crying. It was like on one hand, I was extremely distracted, and I, but on the other hand, I was so happy for him because there was some cl he was clearly letting go of some shit, and I had no context for what he was experiencing at the time, but I was just fascinated. I, 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 it was like we all couldn't wait to hear Steon's feedback at the end of this, and his feedback was ultimately what skyrocketed me into the direction that, I, you know, the life that I'm living now, which was, he said... Out of all the plant medicines and ayahuascas and meditation journeys and psychedelics and everything that he had ever done, and it was the gamut as far as trying and experimenting with everything, nothing was as powerful as this one hour in breath work that he'd ever experienced in his life. And the craziest part is when we saw him the next day, it was like, 
it was like he was born again. Like the skin, the color of his skin almost changed overnight. It was like he went from really pasty, almost, you know, when you see someone that are just not doing so hot, they have kind of a pasty look going. It was like he hit a tanning bed in the night. At least that was my per- perception of it. And he said, first night in six months, he slept all the way through the night without taking a single sleeping pill. And he was struggling with anxiety and I'm pretty sure a little bit of depression and insomnia and all these other things. Had he gone to a doctor, they would have had him loaded up on all sorts of fucking big pharma medications, I'm sure. And he was able to breathe that shit out in an hour. And that was ultimately like the massive turning point for his healing journey. And that was like, light bulb like what the fuck is this why aren't we teaching this to children in schools why aren't we prescribing it to people with anxiety and stress and depression and all these mental health uh disorders that's the real pandemic of what we're dealing with right now and i realized that i can only ask myself that question for so long until it was time for me to take a good hard long look in the mirror and decide if i want this to be the world that i want to live in i need to do it myself and so that was the beginning of Brian the breathwork guy. Brian the breathwork guy. Don't call me breathwork Brian though, Dave. I don't like can, can it. Can we not? Breathwork Brian. I, oh, I just it don't. Sounds, it's, it it's sounds cheesy. terrible. It's it is cheesy. terrible. Yeah, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Brian. It's yeah, going to stick. Thanks, it's stuck a little bit. Yeah, but, good guy. Good guy. Yeah, anyways. So I actually want to pause you a little bit there before you go on to talk a bit more about what it is that you're doing now and how that's come, how that's manifested in the new world that is breathwork Brian. Uh, <laughs> sorry. 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 I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. Fuck off. Fuck off. I think like people are starting to become breathwork's kind of like yoga and like meditation was like you know 10 20 years ago people starting to actually pay attention like yeah in in the mainstream world and I think it's obviously thanks to the amazing Wim Hof and other people out there like that but I think the type of breathwork people are more familiar with is to the types of breathwork that excite the nervous system or that calm it down I think people are less familiar with the emotional release Yep. version of breath work can you speak into that a little bit sure. um for people that maybe don't really understand what is this emotional release why is it important yeah for sure i mean here's the thing it's like we're all struggling we're all fighting our own little battle on some level or another like i've i've guided probably seven or eight thousand students at this point i've had a lot of one-on-one sessions with people people who you would perceive from the outside looking in that their life is just fully in order they got their shit together they must be happy and blissed out all the time and live extremely balanced lives but all the while most people are hiding the shit that they're that's really bothering them on the inside and um most people think that it's the circumstances in our life and the things, our expectations that are not being met that are the real cause of the stress and the anxiety and the depression. Things aren't going our way. Why do I feel like I'm always got the short end of the stick kind of thing? But the reality is most of the things that we're struggling with is dated back to something that is unresolved from our past in some way. It's like we've all heard the, the whole childhood trauma things get, gets thrown around a lot, but it, a lot of people don't really understand the level at which we were soaking things up from the time that we were third trimester in our mother's womb all the way up until we're seven years old. We're literally in a different brainwave state at that time. We're not in alpha brainwave state. We're not in beta brainwave state. Very active kind of analytical prefrontal lobe context, like overanalyzing everything. We're in theta brainwave state at that time. Theta brainwave state, anybody that's familiar with all this geeky science stuff, is the active state of hypnosis. So when you're in hypnosis, you're in theta brainwave state. Everybody's there naturally every single day. The second you wake up in the morning, when you're kind of half in this world, half in the dream world, you're in theta. When you're going to bed at night, same, you're in theta. So anytime you do like self-hypnosis or anything like that, they tell you do it first thing in the morning when you're just waking up or first or right at night when you're going to sleep because it's gonna, what you're listening to is gonna penetrate directly into your subconscious because of the brainwave state that you're in. Now imagine for seven years, you're in a state of hypnosis. So everything that's going on in your reality, how your parents are responding to certain things that you're being programmed by decisions that are being made, thoughts, limiting beliefs, preconceived ideas of the way the world works, um, any kind of uh, verbal abuse, any kind of exposure to anything that is lower vibrational and field of frequency, this, all the things that we're, all of us were exposed to on one level or another when we're children is like soaked directly in, it's registered in the body and it's stuck there and we hold it in our body until we have an opportunity to reconcile that through some way, through doing some kind of work. And it goes back even farther, I'll get a little bit science geek, but this is like really cool science. 
So this whole idea of generational trauma is, is starting to be a lot more discovered now and accepted. This whole idea that we have cellular memory, right? And so they did this, this experiment where they took, not for all of you animal activists out there, you're not going to like this one, but they took uh, mice and they, what they did was they gave these mice um, electrical shock next to the scent of a cherry blossom. So what they wanted to find out was if these mice had children, if they could just with the scent make the children of the mice that had nothing to do with the shock have a stress response or cortisol release response just from the smell. And what they discovered blew them away. Not only did the mice, the children of the mice have that massive cortisol release stress response just at the smell of the cherry blossom, 14 generations of the fucking mice had a stress, massive stress response as if they were still being shocked 14 generations later. Now mice can replicate, can, uh, you know, they can every three months or something, they can have babies. So it didn't take long for 14 generations to happen. But think about that from a position of biology. How much have our ancestors been through in 14 fucking generations? Think about all the war, all the hunger, all the poverty, all the rex racism, sexism, discrimination, all the chaos. Of our, that our ancestors had to endure for us to be able to live the relatively affluent lives that many of us are privileged to live, at least in the Western world, we carry that trauma in our cellular memory. We're holding on to all the trauma of our ancestors. And we wonder why mental health is an absolute fucking epidemic because we haven't figured out how to release that shit at scale yet. Enter breath work. So tramadol isn't the answer for it's a, releasing it's, all of that? It, it, it's the number two answer, but breathwork is number one okay. and way, a far superior way of getting rid of that shit. Okay, so let, let's speak a little bit into that. Um, I, how does breathwork allow the cells to release this buildup of trauma that we're storing? <clears throat> so anytime we have, let's just bring it to practical examples, right? Anytime we have like a fight, flight, fight, flight, or freeze response in the body, especially freeze. Now imagine you're so traumatized. Now it's easier for a woman to imagine this than a man because I can't imagine there's, a, I, I could probably give you something. Imagine like you're about to be attacked by a bear or something like that. You start, you'd probably run. So maybe that's a terrible, the bear. I, I would actually disagree with this because um, so like in the work that I've done, uh, men actually do go into a freeze response, but it's actually in response to more emotional things rather yes, than physical. Exactly. And then so, for the women, it's more physical. Yeah. So like I noticed myself, so like a lot of the tantric work that I've done, I've noticed when like just having to address certain things, like in my relationship, I've noticed that I've got into a freeze response and I've just been kind of numbed out. Or like at a certain point in an argument where I'm having yep. a disagreement, I'm kind of, I just completely shut down. Yep. And that is essentially a freeze response, which I it wasn't is. aware of for a very, very long time. 100%. And that's actually, so let's use both examples. Mm. So one is like a big T trauma. So if you're, um, you're in a situation, you're a life or death situation and you freeze and you literally can't move, that frozen response is like deeply registering the trauma in the body. Mm -hmm. the, the body is just a representation of the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind and the body are, are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And so it's stuck there, it's stored there, it's stored in our fascia, our bones, our muscles, our joints, and until we can unlock and release it, it's gonna stay there. And so for yours, it's a repressed emotional cycle right sure. and so you had an emotional response that came up you went into freeze mode you didn't lean into just allowing yourself to feel push that, that emotional shit response. down you push that shit down all that stuff an accumulation of lifetime a lifetime worth of that stuff is all stored in the body and that's the stuff that actually causes our stress our anxiety our worry our overwhelm our burnout and we blame the circumstances in our life but it's really actually old stuff that has been repressed that we haven't actually properly allowed an opportunity for it to process itself out. We're emotional beings, but we suppress all that stuff. And as a result, you know, we want to be the machismo guys not showing our emotions. We're dooming ourselves to massive mental struggle down the track. So the question that you asked was, how does breath work bring that shit up? <clears throat> okay. The science of breathwork transformation as I teach it inside my program. So two major things are happening when you, do, when you go into doing a conscious, connected, circular style of breathing that um, breathwork journeys, the majority of them include, right? The first thing that happens is a phenomenon called transient hypofrontality. Have you ever heard of it? No. Do educate me, Brian. Okay. Have you ever heard of flow state? Yes. I have a Runner's date. high? 
Yes. All transient hypofrontality. Right. So the flow state and runner's high is just the more socially acceptable way of saying transient hypofrontality. What transient hypofrontality is, when you breathe in this way, you know, we have 75,000 miles worth of blood vessels in our body, right? And so when we do this circular breathing, we're essentially, um, it's called vasoconstriction. So we're constricting all the blood vessels in our body. And so as a result, blood stops flowing to the fit. That's why you get numbness and tingling in your fingers and your toes. But you're slowing down the blood flow to the prefrontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, which is home of the monkey mind, right? So think about it. The monkey mind stops getting its fuel, all right? So the monkey mind sh shuts down, the conscious mind shuts down. When the conscious mind shuts down, the the door to the subconscious mind swings open. That's the, the bottom 95% of the iceberg that's controlling our emotions, our feelings, our behaviors, our actions. Now we have direct access into that. And so that's number one, getting, getting into the subconscious. The second part is our brainwave state shifts. We talked about theta brainwave state already. So we're shifting as we breathe from very active beta brainwave state to theta brainwave state. So now we're in a, a very kind of fluid, dreamy, kind of subconscious mind expanding state. And when we do, when we breathe like this, and we, we do the circular breathing pattern for 45 minutes, we have direct access to allow, we're essentially handing over the keys to the car from the mind that's controlling and running the show all the time down into the body. And when we bring the control down into the body, the body then can allow for whatever it is that it's holding onto to bubble itself to the surface to be released. So a good, a good uh, visual for this is imagine like a, um, like a plastic clear soda bottle, right? You get all these little bubbles that are attached to the sides. How do you get the bubbles to release? Yep. You just tap the button. They come up and they dissolve at the surface and there's absolutely zero resistance whatsoever. It's natural. When we breathe like what we do, like a runaway freight train in my journeys, essentially, boom, we're tapping the body. So all the traumas and the complexes and the stored repressed emotional stuff can just bubble itself to the surface to be released in the form of crying, shaking, moving, screaming in the example that we use inside of my journey. And as a result, after that, it's like, 10 years of psychotherapy in an hour yeah, so without having to talk about it. Uh, yeah, which is always a benefit for a lot of people. Especially right? men. Especially men, which is exactly where I wanted to get to. So obviously I had an amazing journey with you last week. So I've been managing a bunch of shit in my own life right now. And connecting with my emotions has been a, an ongoing journey. Much, It's been a part of everything that I've done, every different healing modality, whether it be plant medicine, whether it be tantra, whether it be breath work. It always for me is coming back to my feeling body and learning how to feel again. Yeah. And that is that has been so difficult for me. So I would go into freeze response in certain kind of situations to do with relationship. You know, I would I would be the type of person to completely overwork because I would I recognize that it was me trying to prove myself to the world. These are all different complexes that I've acquired throughout my lifetime, right, which I want to tap into and move through. And they all come back to the same thing, learn how to feel again, because when you feel, you can process and move through, and then you're no longer held hostage by the memories of your past. Exactly. And feel to heal. That's, that's where the whole coin, it's like there's books that have been written about it. You wanna heal yourself, you gotta learn how to feel yourself deeply. You can't heal without the feeling. And we aren't taught in school how to feel and how to process our emotions, probably by design on some psychopathic level if you think about public school education system and all that but it's a whole other conversation but how many of our parents and and or guardians and or people that are influential in our life pull us aside and say okay let me talk to you about your feelings your emotions and how to process them i came up from a very into a very loving family that wasn't a part of our discussion we didn't talk about that i had to figure that out the hard way which is struggling the way all your way through it, through broken relationships and communication gone sideways and holding stuff in and not being honest about what's going on in your, your, your world. I had one massive experience. I don't know if I should tell it on this podcast. Yes, though. you should. Yes, you should. I'm hijacking. I'm doing way too much of the talking. Do it. I want to talk about your story. Do it. No, no, no. no. Fuck my story. This okay. Guy, all this, right. this is the Brian show today. This is the Brian show today. Okay. Fuck. Am I going to really tell this on the Yes, air? you are. It's okay. happening. So short version of a very long story. So um, we were building Karma House a few years ago, Aaron and I. 
and we were doing a 30 days of giving challenge. No, 21 days of giving. Um, and it's a whole other side story. But there's a book called 21 Gifts, amazing book about how this woman healed herself from multiple sclerosis simply by giving gifts to people for 21 days. True story. We were inspired by it. We decided we wanted to emulate that as part of our Karma House opening. So we went on a giving uh, spree for 21 days to do our part in the community. And we decided one day we were going to go to a party at La Brisa. And we were going to, we had free hug shirts that were made. There was like a, a crew of like five of us. And we were going to go around dishing out. We were going to be This has got Aaron written all over we at this point. Be, it was my idea. But yeah, Aaron was very much a key player. I'm sure he was, yeah. So we decided we were going to be proper Ubudi and hippies and go around and dish out free hugs. And that was like our gift to the tribe for that day. And somebody had the wild idea. It wasn't me. Maybe it was. I can't remember. To bring microdosing of acid into the equation. Because we That thought, was definitely you. <laughs> that was absolutely you. <clears throat> Oh. Yes, um, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, Aaron, I think it was you. If you're watching this, I'm pretty sure it was you. But I didn't, uh, I didn't fight against it. Let's just put it that way. So the short version of the long story is we got a villa in Chengdu, and my wife was pregnant, eight months pregnant at the time. And she, we had one rule, which was we were all in one villa. She's like, look, guys, go have your fun. She wasn't microdosing. Go have your fun. And my only rule is I'm eight months pregnant, so please don't bring the party back here. Like, I, I'm going to need to be able to sleep later as long as we're cool with that. Like, let's go out and have a good time and everything is all gravy. Everyone agreed to it. No problem. This Before the LSD. This particular microdosing of LSD, I don't know what it was in, what was in it, but it was something was off. We were so loopy. We shouldn't have felt this way. It was like we were all properly tripping. Not a good situation whatsoever. I was supposed to be in charge of getting everybody back to the taxis to get everybody home. And I had to go to Anna. She wasn't my wife at the time. And I had to tell her, I had to look at her. I'm like, I'm fucked. Like, I can't find everybody. I don't know how to do. I'm, I have a responsibility. I? Yeah. Can you please help me? Like, I am literally lost in this place. I have no idea how to do this job and get everybody out of here. So, of course, she was like, took ownership. And of course, where did we all end up? All ended up back in the cars, back at the villa. Next thing you know, five minutes go, like f the music flares on, everybody's laughing, enjoying themselves, having a good time. We're all in our own mutual villa. And so I'm in the room and trying to figure out how to go out and tell everybody that they need to be quiet in their own villa so my pregnant wife can go to sleep. And I finally mustered up the courage in order to be able to do that. And I walked out very kind of like stumbling out there. Excuse me, guys. Like my wife is, you know, we had this agreement. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry, so sorry. Five minutes go by and the music flares up again. Everybody's laughing. So she... We were sitting there for like two hours trying to figure out, maybe it wasn't two hours, just maybe that was just an LSD version of the, the, the longer in my head. It was probably 30 minutes. This, this is like being in the present moment with me and my keys. This is where the punchline to this story comes. I'm almost there. And so sh I realized we couldn't get an Airbnb. It was too late. We could, my car was there. We couldn't get a taxi back to, to Ubu. Like every, all the options were off the table. And she finally flipped and she got super frustrated and she's like, fuck this, I'm out of here. Like started to pack up and like she was gonna walk out of there. And something happened, I went into like this immediate bad trip space. And all I could do was go into the bathroom and huddle up like a ball and just scared. Like I'm like, Anna, like please, like please come. I'm having a bad trip, I really need your support. And you know what, she flipped in an instant from frustrated as fuck to there with me. And supportive like in my world what i was going through was i'm the provider i'm the protector i failed my job and i there's nothing i can do for this woman who is carrying my seed and i've i've failed as a, a father basically and a partner and when she flipped to super supportive and was like there for me and 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 i could feel that that it was full of love something cracked open inside of me that day and um I started crying like a baby, gushing. And it was like the floodgates opened. And it was like, it was almost like that whole party conspired to deliver me this bad trip so that I could spend the next three hours crying my face off, letting go of years of shit that I was carrying around. And my girl held me through the entire process. And it was the most healing refreshing, nurturing moment of my life that God gave me this gift to th three hours of sobbing, not a, not a sad cry, of a fucking finally it's time to let all this shit go cry. 
And I was a new man from that point forward. And it was that that, that moment taught me, if you want to fucking cry, cry. Because crying is medicine. And that completes the cycle on so much, so many moments that I probably wanted to cry and curl up in a ball in my life that was all packed in, I didn't even know was there. I let it all go in that, in that three hours and it was done. Cycle completed. I couldn't relate more if I tried right now, as you well know, with obviously everything that's been going on for me with the breakup Matilda and everything that happened there. And in all the tantra work that I've been doing, it was always like, there will be this moment that you crack open. Something will crack you open because I've, I just wouldn't cry for like 10 years. It just wasn't a thing. Even if I thought something was bubbling to the surface, there would be that unconscious reaction just to suppress and push down, suppress, push down. Didn't even know I was doing it. So I just thought, it got to the point where I didn't even feel like I felt it. Yeah. You know, it was kind of nothing was there. And I'd see other people cry and I'd just be like, that doesn't really happen to me. Maybe I'm just broken, you know, maybe I'm just robotic. I don't know what the fuck's up. <laughs> and then through this breakup, obviously it was the most beautiful breakup ever. We like, we separated in the most beautiful way. We lived together for three weeks while this was all going on. Wow. We both love each other deeply, but unfortunately we're just not aligned right now. And it's a really difficult decision. And yeah. when we had to sit down and have that conversation, when I just said the words, I just broke down and just started crying and just couldn't stop. I literally could not stop and it was just like years and years of suppressed emotion and it was like this whole it's literally like it's like shaking up a bottle and then just having the bottle and then suddenly opening the top and it just went it just went flying everywhere yeah. and the the release in that was so powerful afterwards I was completely exhausted but it was like I felt like a new man and then once I'd kind of once the dam had been broken as soon as I meditated for an extended period of time, then I would feel the tears come up again. And this has been going on since, since then. So we, we separated, must have been about eight weeks ago. Yeah. And whenever I go into, I take my, like I have my morning practice, I take myself through emotional processes. And on a regular basis now it comes up. And then one particular day, I was doing my meditation. I was listening to some beautiful music that just brought up some memories of times of me and Matilda, etc. Started crying. Went to move through this whole process. And then on the other side of that, I felt a level of power I have never felt before. Mm -hmm. And I remember like in all the tantra work, like Chantel, Raven, massive shout out to Chantel uh, and Tara also. Love you both, you're both amazing. They would say like underneath all of that, when you can move through, that's how you find your real power by connecting with that level of emotion in a yeah. real and meaningful way. And I was like, yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to keep pushing through, keep pushing through. Eventually I'll get there. But on this day, I was actually at Scott's house when it happened. And once it was gone, I just felt supercharged. It was like mm -hmm. I moved a, a layer of bullshit and it made space for something new. Yep. And what it made space for was, it felt like anger. It was like this fire in me, but it was like anger that was full of love rather than anger that wanted, rather than the type of anger I want to smash people like up. Like passion. Destroy. Yeah, it was a passionate kind of anger that felt really wholesome and real. And the level of motivation I felt for everything that I'm doing right now, every area of work, all of my projects, it was like a whole new fire that I've never experienced before. In the absence of that sadness, in the absence of that fear, what I was holding on to. And ever since then, literally since that moment, Scott can probably even attest to this, like, I've been on fire. You have. Have I or have I not been getting it? <laughs> Who wants it? Who wants it? That's been the motto. That's been the Lifestyle Lab motto for the last two, three weeks. And it's since that moment, it's like, who fucking wants it? Because we're getting it right now. And it's like been that. like that in every single business. Yeah. So I saw it today. Exactly. Exactly that. And the synchronicities that are falling in, the people that are coming into my world, it is literally like space has been made for all this to happen. And I've heard people talk about this. And now it's like it's coming to fruition. And it's a superpower. So when I, whenever I hear about people that are suppression is what I'm talking about this a lot right now because I'm as you can probably tell from the way I'm talking I'm pretty passionate about it I can see it I'm really really passionate about this because this is the aliveness that everybody's really looking for yeah right yeah do you want to be a robot or do you want to be alive you know that's it because the thing is is like these blocks it's not just emotional blocks. It blocks us from our creativity. It blocks us from being able to think clearly and rationally and logically. It, it blocks us from our uh, tapping into our intuition and, and really just expressing the full humanness that we have. Like here's where everybody, well, so many people, not everybody, fuck it up. We have this preconceived idea that everybody should just feel okay all the time. 
And that's just not the way the fucking world works. You're never going to feel okay or great or happy all the time. And so we try to block these times when we don't feel good, block it out, suppress it, pretend like it doesn't exist, make a bunch of complex stories around it. Like I'm sad, so I, there needs to be a because and I need to blame something in my life or there needs to be something I can attribute this sorrow to. And the reality is sometimes you might just feel fucking sad. And that's okay. And that's okay. It's like a, a, a flip of the coin. Sometimes it's going to be heads and you're going to feel great. And sometimes it's going to be tails. And you're going to feel like shit. And the key is allow, simply accepting, allowing, and just going with whatever the result is of that, of that flip every single day. But just don't fucking get stuck there. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that because it becomes this whole game of people trying to avoid negativity, people trying to avoid pain. But the real superpower is existing within the pain and just surrendering to it. Let it be what it is. And then the aliveness just runs through you, right? And then yeah. learn to be with it all. And yeah. I had this when people like ask me, I've actually gotten the habit of saying this now, they're like, how are you feeling? And I don't just say, yeah, I'm good. You know, like the conventional, just autonomous subconscious response to fucking anybody that asks me how I am. I don't do that anymore. I'd be like, yeah, I'm feeling kind of sad, sad right now, but yeah, just getting on with some work. Honest. But just, yeah, I just say it how it is. And you know how many people who are then like, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to fix this? I'm not trying to fix it. I'm sad. That's okay. I don't feel great right now. That's also okay. I'm yeah. absolutely fine with it. I'm at peace with this feeling. And I'm going to move through it. And maybe tomorrow, do you know what? I'll be skipping down the road, loving life, <laughs> laughing to myself. And that can get you through some of the most challenging... Because there, there's, there's even another layer to the reframe. It's like... And I say this inside of my journeys. It's like, are you, do you hurt... Are you uncomfortable? Do you feel off? Do you feel sad? Do you feel lonely? Do you feel depressed? Fucking good. You're growing. That's like the ultimate indicator that you're growing, that you're transforming. It's, uh, we don't transform through our good days. We transform through our adversity. So when adversity comes up, or do, do we want to run away from it and resist it? Or do we want to say, aha, there's a teacher here. What is this to show? What is this here to show me? How can I integrate it? And it, that makes the the challenging days. Like I sometimes I'll lay in my bed. I don't even want to get out of bed. And I used to put myself through such crazy guilt trips for just wanting to stay in bed and not be productive for a day and whatever else the case is. Now I just let my it's like fuck all that. I'm just gonna let myself allow allow myself to lay in bed, not do shit, feel like shit, and be completely okay with it. And that is something, if you could put that in a bottle and, and sell it, that has mass market appeal because so many people get lost in their struggles and their challenges. This is why I'm doing this work, is that mental health is at an all-time crazy out of control level right now. It's like 11% of the adult American population prior to COVID suffered from SAD stress, general anxiety, and depression. It's at 41% right now. And that's just the people that are reporting it. 41% of people are losing their shit on the daily basis and they don't have the tools other than Prozac to be able to hedge against that shit. And there needs to be a revolution in healthcare because we, the, the, the solutions for this stuff are at the tip of our fingers. We just need to be able to figure out how to access it and do it completely holistically. And that's what drives me. Because the struggle is real, but we don't, people don't have to get stuck in the, we get stuck in the struggle. And then the struggle permeates everything in our lives. And next thing you know, we're 40 years old, we're in some job that we can't stand, we're dying by the monotony, just trying to figure out where we missed a turn and everything feels like it's going to hell in a handbasket and people just aren't sure what to do about it. That's no way to live. It absolutely isn't. And especially when there are so many tools out there, which is what this podcast is about. It's what my business is about. It's about what your business is. And so many of the other amazing people here in Bali that are all trying to have a positive impact on the world. There are so many things that human beings can do that don't require medication or outside aid. Simply just a little bit of help, a little bit of simple education, a little bit of guidance. And it's all there. And there are so many amazing results and so many beautiful stories off the back of it. And I think that's a perfect segue into the work that you're now doing because you've, you've touched on breath, you've explained all the journeys that you've been on, but what you've put together now is something really, really special. And 
I say that from the bottom of my heart because I experienced it last week and you took me through an amazing process and I had another opportunity to cry and make space for some new beautiful shit that's coming through. And I would love you to tell people what it is that you put together because it's powerful as fuck. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Let's go there. So when COVID kicked in, I, everything went digital for so many people, right? And so I was doing retreats and I was doing all sorts of stuff at the Astana and, um, and so like most people, I moved the majority of what I was doing online. And I realized that there's a lot of, to be able to go and do a breathwork journey kind of experience, like I explained in the beginning of this thing, you would either need to go and be with a facilitator in a room, in like a retreat, or like a, you know, where, wherever, in some kind of shala somewhere, or you would need to be on a Zoom call and be guided. But if you go on Google, you go on YouTube, there isn't a lot of breathwork journeys um, that are out there that are like digital, good quality digital experiences for a number of reasons. I don't want to go off on too many tangents, but essentially what happened was I woke up and from a really deep sleep. With the, It was like this massive light bulb moment. And what came through was this whole idea of how do I create an audio breathwork experience that will take people into the deepest parts of their psyche and their subconscious and heal them from the inside out without having to be in the room with them to deliver it. Something that can send somebody an MP3 and they can do it anywhere in the world and have a, a fully visceral, massively emotional response and be able to purge all this stuff that's holding them back. And ultimately what came out of that idea was what you experienced the other day. And essentially there's some layers to it. So we have the breath work to the music. The music, most music is produced at 440 hertz. Anybody that knows anything about how hertz works, um, it's very chaotic to the system. There's a whole conspiracy conversation that we could have in regards to why music is produced at 440 hertz, but that's a whole nother conversation. T just chuck the theory out there. Just, just touch on it. it Enlighten me. It, it, has a, it, it produces a chaotic response in the, in the nervous system for people that it fucks with our brainwave state, essentially 440 hertz. It's chaos. Okay. Yeah. And you don't notice it to the human ear. But 432 hertz, for example, sounds exactly the same, but it has a, the exact opposite effect on the body and the okay. brainwave state. A very healing. So you can go on YouTube and you can search 432 hertz music and you'll get all sorts of different stuff. So I tune all my music to 432 hertz, but then what I did was I brought in a bunch of layers. So I know hypnosis, hypnotherapy is incredibly powerful. Um, subliminal messaging like there's massive all the whole advertising industry in the united states and pretty much throughout the world capitalizes on subliminal messages having a deeply impactful effect on the conscious and the subconscious mind and so what i did was i took elements that are really powerful on their own binaural beats subliminal messaging 432 hertz and different sound frequencies plus breath work and i basically just sandwiched them all together and I created, as far as what I know, I'm pioneering kind of the combination of all of these elements into one proper deep dive, mind expanding, subconscious mind reprogramming soup. And I'm delivering it in high definition quality sound that anybody can do anywhere in the world as long as they have a good set of headphones. And I, it, the funny part about this, this creation is if you ever created something and it came so naturally that you, it was almost like, for lack of a better expression that doesn't sound too woo-woo, that it came through you, it's almost like you channeled it into the world, it just came so easily and effortlessly, that's this. It just, it, once I decided that I was gonna do it, it was like all the people that I needed to the sound engineers and the sound effects makers and the, everybody just came into my field and it was created like that and my intention is to revolutionize the breathwork industry and take it to a level to which it has never gone before for the interest of mass healing and giving people the medicine that's, that, that, that they need in order to be able to resolve so much of the shit that we're carrying around at the top fucking levels. And so that's now my mission and my vision and my purpose for living in this world is to get this out to as many people as I can. 
I love that summary, my man. I absolutely love it. And I can talk from personal experience. That was powerful, powerful shit. I've done breath work. I've done all sorts of different things, but that took me on such a deep, deep dive and you facilitated it so well. Um, I would love to see what this looks like for other people. I want to see what this looks like at scale. I really want to see that. I'm interested, how does it work when someone's doing it by themselves? Because I know you mentioned that some people like in the breath work space, they're like, oh, it needs to be facilitated in person. You need to be there. What does this look like when you are able to give it to people, to allow people to go on their own journeys? It's a really good question. <clears throat> and one that is probably up for debate, but I can only give you my personal experience with it. Sure. So there's breath work facilitators out there that if there's, for every three people in a room, there needs to be some kind of supporter or a breath work angel of some sort. Um, because so much can come up in the process of, of doing these deep dive experiences that the understanding from some people is that there needs to be a support system that's there in order to be able to hold space for the, those individuals. And to a certain extent, I agree with that. However, it comes with a very strong caveat, which is ultimately, look, things can go sideways doing just about anything. You know, you can be at the gym and drop a dumbbell, a 70 pound dumbbell on your, on your nose and you could crush your face and you can have a really bad day as a result of that. Does it happen often? No, not really. Has it happened before? Sure. But I'll tell you in this nearly seven or probably 8,000 people at this point, the majority of those I've, were online, probably 90% of them online. I've never had anything go sideways before ever. So as a result, I have a lot of confidence in the way that I teach and the way that I preframe the experience, which is very simple. We have control, our breath is a, a part of our autonomic nervous system. It's the only part of our autonomic nervous system that we have any conscious control over. You can't control your heart rate or your, your digestion or all the many different processes that are going on automatically inside of your body. However, you can control your breath. And so when you can control your breath, you're the captain of your own ship. Right? And so when you're the captain, you take personal responsibility for your journey, right? If your boat hits a rock, it's your fault. You, if you see a rock coming, AKA trauma, you can slow down or turn the boat. And so as we're, <gasps> we're doing this deep breathing, if we're feeling something so scary that's coming up, we have, a, we have an option to just take our foot off the gas, pump the brake, breathe through our nose, slow down, come out, come back in when we're ready. We have direct control over whether we wanna go deep into the trauma or whether we wanna back out from the trauma and come back and face that demon another day. As a result, that personal responsibility gives us account self-responsibility, gives us the accountability in order to be able to pull ourselves out of the process if we need to. Let me give a practical example of this. So I told you this story before. Um, but your listeners obviously haven't heard it before. I get on a phone call with a woman who wants to sign up for my program, 67 years old. And she tells me, before we get into it, she said, Brian, before we talk about your program, I just want to tell you what I experienced from doing the journey that you sent me. The same one that I did for, for you, but she did it on her own with headphones in the comfort of her own bedroom. She said, when I was a kid, I was kidnapped by knife point and I was tortured and held hostage. And I'm like, inside I was like, fuck. Like, where's this? I was expecting a not so positive kind of story to come of this, but I let her talk and I was just very present with her. She said, for the majority of my adult life, I barricaded my door closed because I was afraid of all this trauma. I was afraid of getting kidnapped again. And she said, I did therapy and psychotherapy and I did all these different regimens. Nothing stuck. Nothing got rid of the trauma. She said, I did, then I did your breathwork journey. And in one hour, I felt so in my body, I was able to transcend what happened to me as a child. And not only that, I was able to hold my kidnapper in a light of, self, of, light, light of love and forgiveness. And I was able to forgive him and move on. And she said, for the first time in my life, I feel free, like I can really start living. And it made me realize that I'm not happy in the 40 year job that I've been doing. I wanna quit my job and I wanna become a breath coach and share this medicine with the world. Why am I sharing this story? Not to brag, but to give you a proper example of that woman had the deepest level of potential trauma that happened to her. You, most people can't relate with that level of trauma. She went in, she had the courage to go in and do that experience. I gave her all the information that she needed in order to be able to go in confidently and do it. And you know what? When shit started coming up, she didn't take her foot off the brake, uh, put, put her foot on the brake. She pumped the fucking gas pedal to the floor and she popped through that trauma that she'd been carrying around her whole life. This is what's possible for everyone. 
And so all the haters out there that say you need to have angels in a room, God bless you if that is your style and you love it and that works for you, go for it. Good luck scaling it. I wanna scale. I wanna reach millions of people, not hundreds of people in a room. In order to be able to do that, I need to be able to exercise great responsibility. They say with great power comes great responsibility. I put a lot of duty of care into making sure that everybody knows exactly how they need to come into this emotionally to be able to get through it because it's a fucking process. And how can you justify the risk versus reward? If uh, every one person that could have a bad trip, if thousands have to not get this type of medicine, to me, statistically, that doesn't make sense. No, look at the vaccines. Oh, we're going there. We're going we straight even... in there. We're going straight into vaccine injuries. What, what's, what, what's your personal? More uh, vaccine uh, injuries with this one vaccine than in the history of all vaccines combined in the shortest period of time. That's all I'm going to say. Let's move on. Beautiful. I think, I think that's a perfect point to wrap up. I would love for you to tell people where they can find this medicine because I can attest to how powerful it is. The story that you just told is really, really powerful. And I know there's so many people out there which is, who are suffering from soft trauma, hard trauma, and they have no real understanding of how to get by it. I have so many people, part of our community, that come talking to me about they want to get their mindset right. And I'm at a stage of my journey where I realize that so much more is about embodiment. It's yeah. really about those emotional processes. And mindset can get you so far. I totally believe that it can shift your perspective on your reality. However, there are things that are stored in your body that go far beyond that. Yeah. And this is a medicine that taps into that without you have to go sit ayahuasca in the jungle, without you have to do a shitload of mushrooms or an LSD journey. This is something that you can safely do in your home and you are making this possible right now. So this is an answer for so many people. So please can you tell people how they get more access to you, how they can get access to your programs so they can get hold of this medicine. Yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> I guide journeys online once a month. So if anybody wants to jump into one of those, they can uh, go to my Instagram, breathwork.journeys. Next one is going to be on June 22nd. So it's coming up. So I do a deep dive online. I have a breathwork course that's like 30 days for anyone who wants to like properly integrate breathwork to maintain the level of clarity that you get after a journey so it's sustainable um, you can get all access to that all through my my instagram website being developed right now best place is just to reach out to me on instagram anybody who wants to try out this experience i give it away for free for anybody who really needs it all that i ask is that you actually do it and you share some feedback with me on how it was um, because ultimately I would never want financial restrictions or limitations to stop people from getting the healing that they need. So no matter what people's situation is financially, like I'll, we'll figure out a way to make it work. So just reach out to me on Instagram. Let me know what you got going on and, um, I'll make sure that you have all the tools in order to be able to put this stuff to work. I love that, man. I love that. And you're also going to come do some bits for the lifestyle lab, right? Indeed. You're going to come in. Let's you're going to do, do a breathwork journey for some of my guys. It. Let's do it. Yeah, I know. Like the last time you came and did breathwork, there was some serious hype around it. Everyone loved oh, it. Oh, that's right. I and forgot about that yeah, one. We did came, it for you. You crew. came in before. Yeah, yeah we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. We're going to do the new version, the new Boom. and improved bad boy. 2.0. And I'm you're ready. coming on the Bali retreat, right? I'm ready. Okay. I for can't anyone that promise you know, in January that I'm going to be Jan there. <laughs> January, we've got the Bali retreat, the Lifestyle Lab Bali retreat. I'm down. Brian is going to be there helping you get rid of all those trapped emotions. I'm uh, done. I, my, um, my superpower is making people cry. It's a very strange or laugh. thing. Or laugh. Yeah, but mo I, get more, I get more pleasure from getting, making people cry for some reason. I know you do. And it's not a fuck. sadistic thing at all. It was <laughs> with me. It is. it is with me. Maybe it's a little bit. Of is, it, little is it just me? Maybe. You look really happy when I was. I was, it was, I was elated yeah. watching you crying. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the happiest moments of my life. Is that weird? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so if you're looking for a good I'm just cry, disappointed. I'm, I'm just disappointed that sex wasn't one of the happiest moments <laughs> of your life. That was, that's all it was. Uh, sorry. A top five. Okay, cool. Yeah, right, good. Thanks for having me, bro. Thank you very much, brother. Always a pleasure. a pleasure. Yeah, same. <laughs>